Racism was intellectually respectable in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And one version of it, popular on both sides of the Atlantic, was the idea that the Anglo-Saxons were destined, either by God or by nature, to rule the rest of the world. Cecil Rhodes made a fortune in the South African diamond and gold business, then built a semi-private empire, Rhodesia, based on this idea. The Rhodes Scholarships, to which he bequeathed his fortune, were originally designed to create a secret society of Anglo-Saxon rulers who might unify the world around a nucleus of Britain and its colonies. Theodore Roosevelt, meanwhile, was one of the Americans who aspired to create a colonial empire for the United States that could vie with Britons and believe that it would carry the blessings of Anglo-Saxon commerce, Christianity and good government to the benighted parts of the earth. Roosevelt, though a politician familiar with the rough and tumble world of democratic politics, also held a high ideal of public service and a sense of noblesse oblige toward the less fortunate. Like fighting aristocrats of earlier times, he exalted the warrior virtues and despised the softness of a peaceful commercial world. Anglo-Saxon advocates in Britain and America alike dreaded socialism and advocated a kind of race purity that would later come to seem sinister and disgraceful. Well, many British and American conservatives shared the idea that, as Anglo-Saxons, they belonged to a master race that was destined to dominate the world. There was nothing new about racial discrimination in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but it now enjoyed the support of science. I mentioned previously how the economists adapted Darwinian ideas. Darwinian ideas are also adapted by ethnologists, who regarded the Anglo-Saxons as the fittest in a competition among the Earth's different races. And this is a theme which crops up in a lot of books of those years. For example, William Z. Ripley wrote uh, The Races of Europe, published in 1899. He was a, an anthropologist and a professor of economics at Columbia University, certainly not regarded as a crackpot in his day. He divides the peoples of Europe essentially into three main groups. The Teutonics, who come from Northern Europe, the Mediterraneans, and the Alpines, and they're clearly in descending order of quality as you go further south, and below them, in places like North Africa, are what he refers to as the scrub races. This is an attempt to say, even within Europe, there are several different racial groupings. Another such book is Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, from 1916. It's a kind of lament for the fact that the Anglo-Saxons are in danger. Madison Grant was anti-immigrant, and he was in favour of eugenics. Very often Anglo-Saxonism and eugenics went together. By that is meant the idea that criminals should be sterilised, so should degenerates, to prevent them from reproducing. And that on the other hand, uh, we should encourage the breeding of the racially most favoured people, which in his case meant the Anglo-Saxons. He was fascinated by doctrines of racial hygiene, and fears that indiscriminate immigration to America was leading to what he called race suicide. The idea, the idea of immigration restriction had come up uh, among the mugwumps and was intensified in the first two decades of the 20th century, ultimately leading to immigration restriction laws in the 1920s. Well, Madison Grant was the head of the New York Zoological Society, interested in, in biology. On one famous occasion, he put a pygmy from the Congo, a man named Otter Benga, on display besides the apes and the chimpanzees in a cage adjacent to the orangutan. The man's family had been massacred in the Belgian Congo, one of the most disgraceful arenas of Western imperialism. Uh, Madison Grant's agents got him from a tribal slave trader. Now, ironically, in the end, this show was, had to be ended because of the protests by Baptist clergymen who didn't like the idea of an exhibit that argued along Darwinian lines, in other words, emphasising the similarity or the alleged similarity of a man with an animal. Uh, Madison Grant's point was, we can see this evolutionary procession taking place. And the Baptist minister's view was, no, we can't. God made man once distinct and was completely different. Ironically, the most consistent opponents of eugenics throughout were the evangelical ministers. Well, scientific racism was not intrinsically conservative, and indeed it appealed to many progressives, 
Because we look back on eugenics through the Hitler period, and because we know of the outrages which were uh, undertaken in the name of eugenics, we're instinctively horrified. But in the early 20th century, many people who thought of themselves as politically progressive were attracted to the idea that you ought to be busy trying to make a better population as well as a better society. Still, it is true that Eugenics and the uh, idea of Anglo-Saxon supremacy suited very well the outlook of the British and American empire builders. Certainly it was central to the Conservatives' intellectual justification of the British Empire. Now, in our era, empire building is also very out of fashion. One thing we need to remember as we study these people from 100 or 120 years ago is that the Anglo-Saxon empire builders were not ashamed of their conduct on the contrary, they were very, very proud of it. They took seriously the idea that they belonged to a race which was particularly privileged and particularly gifted and better able to run the world than anybody else. It was certainly one of the governing ideas in the life of Cecil Rhodes, whose diamond and gold businesses and whose political adventures expanded the British presence in southern Africa. He made his first great fortune in diamonds at Kimberley in, 80, in the 1870s, which is in South Africa. And then he got into the Johannesburg gold mining boom in the 1880s. He was the head of a private company, the South Africa Company, and it undertook the annexation of the country to the north of South Africa, which it then named after him. Rhodesia, or uh, Rhodesia, is a place named after him. He also was able to take advantage of the new machine guns, then recently invented by Hiram Maxim, to annihilate the natives. Small forces in Rhodes' company were able to take on and defeat much larger groups of African tribesmen because of their immense, the immense technological superiority of their weapons. Northern Rhodesia is now, the, is now called Zambia, and southern Rhodesia is now called Zimbabwe. Rhodes planned a railway to run all the way from the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa all the way up to Cairo in Egypt. And his hope was that it would run all the way through an unbroken line of British colonies. Everybody would benefit from it, he said. Quote, we are the first race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. This was also the idea behind the Rhodes Scholarship, which remains uh, popular right up to the present, a prestigious too. Rhodes's idea originally was that it should be a secret society of Anglo-Saxon leaders gathered from all over the, all over the Anglo-Saxon world. That's why it was, it was accessible to um, Americans, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, white South Africans and Germans, because these were the Teutonic or the Anglo-Saxon people. And the idea was that they'd all come together at Oxford University, the ancient centre of this civilization, and then radiate out from there to create a, an English-speaking governing class for the entire world. In its uh, secrecy and its dedication, it was supposed to be comparable to the Jesuits. Lord Milner, another of the great British Empire builders in Africa, uh, coming in the generation immediately after Rhodes, said, my patriotism knows no geographical, but only racial limits. I am an imperialist and not a little Englander, because I am a British race patriot. It is not the soil of England which is essential to arouse my patriotism, but the speech, the traditions, the spiritual heritage, the principles, the aspirations of the British race. Another of these Anglo-Saxon enthusiasts was Lord Curzon, who linked uh, these racial ideas with traditional ideas about social hierarchy uh, and saw those together as the key to Britain holding on to its grip on its great empire in India. Lord Curzon came from an aristocratic family in Derbyshire. I grew up just a few miles away from his great house, Kedleston Hall. Curzon was the Viceroy of India before the age of 30. He was very much a, a brilliantly gifted politician and very well connected too. He favoured in India the very maximum of hierarchy among the British. In fact, under his organisation, the whites in India were divided into 77 distinct ranks. And he tried to induce among them a general craving for status and honours as a way of getting everybody to work hard and to aspire up.
He also created a parallel but much lesser status pyramid for the Indian princes. One of the ways in which the British were able to rule India with very few of their own people on the ground was by keeping in place many of the old Indian princes who simply had to uh, pay regular tributes to the British and otherwise were left largely alone to run their own affairs. So, he, so Lord Curzon hated the idea of equality. That was anathema to him. The ideal, rather, was one of a feudal pyramid. It was a great way of running the empire on the cheap, but always subject to ultimate British approval. Curzon also introduced or intensified the elaborate rituals of the empire in India. The architecture itself was significant. The Viceroy's house in Calcutta was an exact copy of his ancestral home, Kedleston Hall. The great Durbar of 1903, held to celebrate the coronation of King Edward VII, uh, brought together many of the Indian princes, and they rode in a vast procession of elephants. The king's message, which was probably written by Curzon himself, said this, His empire is strong because it regards the liberties and respects the dignities and rights of all his feudatories and subjects. The keynote of British policy in India has been to conserve all the best features in the fabric of native society. By that policy, we have attained a wonderful measure of success. In it, we recognise an assured instrument of further triumphs in the future. Well, describing the people as feudatories and subjects rather than citizens is itself a way of summoning up uh, ancient traditions. Now, in the House of Lords crisis, which I, t I spoke about last time, I think it's significant that Lord Curzon, who by then was back in Britain, was at first one of the ditchers, determined not to yield to parliamentary reform and to the diminution of the powers of the House of Lords. But ultimately, fearing uh, the, the, the denigration of the power of his noble title, he switched his, he, he switched his position and became a hedger so that the exclusivity of the aristocracy would go on undiminished. The idea of the special responsibilities and duties and, and privileges and benefits of being an Anglo-Saxon comes through very vividly also in the, most famous, the work of the most famous poet of the British Empire, Rudyard Kipling. In a poem named The White Man's Burden, he argues that it's a necessary burden for the Anglo-Saxons to rule people throughout the rest of the world. In light of their superior civilization, their greater ability in politics, and their religion, Christianity. So imperialism, as, as Kipling presents it, is a form of self-sacrifice and self-denial. Listen to the first verse of this famous poem. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go, bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. This idea that the, uh, the native peoples of the world were half devils and half children was typical. It's insulting and condescending at the same time, but the kind of um, sentiment which is very popular in its day. Now this poem in particular was written to urge the United States to take on an imperial mission of its own at the time of the Spanish-American War, which broke out in 1898, and as a result of which the United States took over Cuba, Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Take up the white man's burden is Kipling saying to the Americans, don't be afraid to do it too. You're Anglo-Saxons as well and, could, and should do this. Now there certainly were plenty of people in the United States who agreed with this idea and were eager for the United States to become an empire builder as well. One of them was the Indiana Senator Albert Beveridge. He denied that the conquest of the North American continent had brought to an end the mission of manifest destiny. This idea which had been so strong in the 1830s and 40s particularly that, that God himself had um, given to the Americans the mission of spreading across the whole continent. After the census of 1890 demonstrated that there was no longer a recognisable frontier line, many Americans said, what's going to happen now that we've lost that defining feature of our national life of the preceding decades? Well, our, uh, Senator Be Beveridge's answer is, now it's time for us to spread into the Pacific uh, as part of our mission to civilise the rest of the world. Here's what he said to the US Senate in the speech of January the 9th, 1900. The Philippines are ours forever. We will not repudiate our duty in the archipelago. We will not abandon our opportunity in the Orient 
We will not renounce our part in the mission of our race, trustee under God of the civilization of the world. My own belief is that there are not a hundred men among them, meaning the Filipinos, who comprehend what Anglo-Saxon self-government even means, and there are over five million people to be governed. It has been charged that our conduct of the war has been cruel. Senators, it has been the reverse. Senators must remember that we are not dealing with Americans or Europeans, we are dealing with Orientals. In other words, again, clearly a double standard. Our, our rough and ready methods of warfare might not have been suitable with the European enemy, but so long as we're treating with, with, with Orientals, it's entirely appropriate. Well, there's no more famous American imperialist or aspiring American imperialist than Theodore Roosevelt. He longed for the United States to emulate Britain's empire-building role. And his outlook bore a striking resemblance to that of Britain's conservative imperialists. Theodore Roosevelt himself was an unashamed elitist. He regarded himself as one of the natural rulers in his community. He'd been born in 1858 and it was a source of lasting regret to him that he was too young to take part in the American Civil War. And throughout his early life he longed to have a war in which he too could participate. He came from the patrician class in New York, didn't have to uh, work for his living. And he deplored those members of his class, his social class, who shirked what he saw as their duty of political leadership. Now that the uh, government of New York City and to some extent state had fallen into the hands of the Tammany Ring and the immigrant gra uh, grafters, most of the patricians shied away from doing it, but Theodore Roosevelt was willing to get into it. He said it was necessary to get his hands dirty in the rough and tumble of Tammany politics, because otherwise he'd be betraying his class's duty of leading the, the people. A sense of noblesse oblige was very strong in him to help those less fortunate around him through political action. Roosevelt, like so many in his class, detested socialists, anarchists, and all forms of utopianism, of all forms of utopians, who, as he saw it, misunderstood the hard, unchanging realities of human life. Of all the people who have been president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt is far and away the best writer, and he was a prolific one too. In his books about the uh, history of the early republic, he was full of praise for the Federalists, the Conservatives of the 1790s, and full of scorn for the Jeffersonians. He famously called Tom Paine, the, uh, the, the radical pamphleteer, a filthy little atheist. Theodore Roosevelt favoured the summary execution of anarchists. At the time of the Haymarket strike in 1886 in Chicago, when an anarchist bomb was thrown into a crowd, he wanted to line up a group of anarchists and shoot them right there on the spot. In 1901, he became president because another anarchist, Zoglosh, had shot President McKinley, to whom he was vice president. Theodore Roosevelt wrote, It was a crime against free government, a thousand times worse than any murderer of a private individual could be. We should war with relentless efficiency, not only against anarchists, but against all active and passive sympathizers with anarchists. He was dismissive also of radical proposals for social change. He, he despised William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic candidate of 1896, and several subsequent elections, the candidate who favoured the coinage of free silver. In 1896, Roosevelt wrote that, Jen that William Jennings Bryan threatened a frightful disaster that would plunge all our people into conditions far worse than any of those for which he sought a remedy. Now, one of the ways in which uh, Theodore Roosevelt marks himself out as a conservative, I think, is that he believed that war was a permanent part of the human condition and that men are, were destined to fight. They always had done and they always would do. No amount of goodwill or sentimental optimism is going to change the ir ineradicable human propensity for fighting and for the quest for power. His writings always glorified warriors and denigrated pacifists. It's significant that uh, in the 1880s, when for a while he lived in the Great Plains in the Dakotas, he was totally uns unsentimental about the displacement of the Plains Indians who'd lived there right up until the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, after which they'd been forcibly rounded up and placed in um, reservations. His view was, in war the whites defeated the Indians. He described the Indians as a set of treacherous, revengeful and fiendishly cruel savages. 
They might have been picturesque, but they'd been defeated and they must go. He advocated the strenuous life. He said, especially now that America's becoming an industrial nation, more and more of whose population live in the cities, there's the danger that American men are going to lose the warrior virtues. They're going to become soft. And we've got to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. As a teenager, he'd also been asthmatic and weak, and some other boys had once bullied him, and he was so ashamed of the memory of that incident that he put himself into a very intense training regimen to make himself a boxer, to make himself capable of fighting. He loved hunting and wrote several books on hunting, meanwhile becoming an expert on the game animals that he liked to pursue. It's highly characteristic of Theodore Roosevelt that he should go into these questions so detail, in such detail that in the 80s and 90s he was recognised as one of America's leading experts on several animals of the kind which he himself hunted in the American West. He favoured universal military training. Finally, in the late 1890s, in 1898, he had the chance to participate in a war. By that time, he'd risen up through Republican Party ranks and had got a lucrative and important position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. But at once, when Pres President McKinley declared war, he resigned this office so that he could raise a regiment of soldiers and take them off to fight. And this regiment was the famous Rough Riders. His book, The Rough Riders, which he wrote immediately after the campaign in Cuba, is a vivid evocation of the regiment he raised. It was a mixture of old Dakota cowboys whom he'd met in the 80s when he was working on his ranch out there, friends from Harvard, and friends from Wall Street, businessmen. The whole point of the Rough Riders was it was meant to be a symbolic regiment, a cross-section of society, showing how men great and small from all parts of American life could get together. And, in his view, they were a perfect manifestation of the great Anglo-Saxon virtues. At one point in the book, Roosevelt actually writes, We drew recruits from among men in whose veins the blood stirred with the same impulse which once sent the Vikings over sea. This idea that the Rough Riders are themselves descendants of the Vikings, one of these great Teutonic peoples. The regular army hated the Rough Riders and hated him in particular because they could see that he was a media hound. He loved to draw as much attention as he possibly could to himself and as a, a practiced politician he was very, very good at drawing the favourable attention of the journalists. He was a constant violator of the chain of command. But of course the journalists loved his swagger and his daring and his outspoken statements. Regular army officers take pride in keeping their casualties as low as possible. But Roosevelt welcomed a high casualty rate because he thought that every man who died in the Rough Riders would be kind of annealing himself as a martyr to this, uh, this sacrificial um, union of the Anglo-Saxon peoples. He, he took part in the very, very risky assault of the, the Battle of San Juan Hill, which, which made him a national hero. When he came back to America and after the publication of the book, in very quick succession he was made governor of New York, then he became vice president, then President McKinley was shot and he became president in 1901. Another way in which Roosevelt was clearly a conservative is the way in which he honoured tradition and the old virtues, particularly the virtues of fidelity, self-reliance, bravery and hard work. Here's a passage from the introduction to his autobiography in which Roosevelt states, There is need to develop all the virtues that have the state for their sphere of action. But these virtues are as dust in a windy street, unless back of them lie the strong and tender virtues of a family life based on the love of one man for one woman, and on their joyous and fearless acceptance of their common obligation to the children that are theirs. There must be the keenest sense of duty, and with it must go the job of living. There must be shame at the thought of shirking the hard work of the world, and at the same time delight in the many-sided beauty of life. With soul of flame and temper of steel, we must act as our coolest judgment bids us. We must exercise the largest charity toward the wrongdoer that is compatible with relentless war against wrongdoing. That's a little taste of his beautiful, although sometimes purple, rhetoric. Other Anglo-Saxon conservatives in America shared many of Roosevelt's opinions and enthusiasms. One of them was Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, a Massachusetts politician who earlier had studied under Henry Adams, Henry Adams the, the uh, neo-medievalist, the traditionalist, who looked back to the great French cathedrals. Ca Henry Cabot Lodge had studied under Henry Adams. He also was intensely af afraid 
that the great Anglo-Saxon race was going to decline in the face of mass immigration. And he became one of the leaders of the anti-immigration movement. Lodge wrote, More precious than the forms of government are the mental and moral qualities which make what we call our race. While those stand unimpaired, all is safe. When those decline, all is imperiled. They are exposed to but a single danger, and that is by changing the quality of our race and citizenship through the wholesale infusion of races, whose traditions and inheritances, whose thoughts and beliefs are wholly alien to ours, and with whom we have never been assimilated or even been associated with in the past. Another of this group, also a friend of Roosevelt, as was Lodge, was Alfred Thayer Mahan, the naval historian. He agreed with Roosevelt that war is a permanent part of the human condition and that the ability to win naval battles is the key to world domination. He was a, a, life, a lifelong Navy officer. He had been a junior officer in the Union Navy during the Civil War. His book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, published in 1890, became immensely influential on both sides of the Atlantic. He'd been given the job of teaching at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and the book was based upon his lectures, explaining why the British had gradually built up a world-dominating empire. And he showed that the key, was, the key to the British Empire was the capacity to win naval battles and keep the sea lanes open between Britain's colonies. Now, eventually, the Navy ordered him back to sea on the USS Chicago. Some of the admirals were a bit dubious about the value of his work as a writer. One admiral actually said, it's not the business of a Navy officer to write books. But when Mahan got to the United Kingdom, to Britain, his, his, uh, his, his voyage suddenly became a kind of triumphal procession. He was given an honorary doctorate by Oxford University and one by Cambridge in the same week, the first person ever so honoured. Because uh, British politicians and, and strategists understood the importance of his book. He'd explained to Britain in a systematic way, really for the first time, the essential cause of their own world dominance. It's not that the British hadn't understood the importance of their navy, but it had never been codified quite so uh, convincingly and coherently before as it was now in Mahan's book. Perhaps even more significant is that two nations whose, whose strategists took notice were Germany and Japan, both of which reacted to Mahan by building big navies of their own, with immense consequences for the 20th century, culminating obviously in the Second World War. Already in 1905, the Japanese astonished the rest of the world by winning a great navy victory against the Russian navy at the Battle of Tsushima. And uh, every one of the Japanese battleships had a Japanese translation of Mahan's book there on the bridge. At a disarmament conference in The Hague, shortly before the First World War, Mahan was one of the American negotiators. And he favoured voting against a motion for the international outlawing of poison gas shells, of the kind which were actually going to be used to horrifying effect in the trenches of the First World War. Now, why was Mahan against outlawing them? Here's, here was his reasoning. He said, all sorts of previous weapons, including crossbows, had been outlawed, but then later they were used anyway in warfare. Mahan's view was, it's much better to create these weapons and not be taken by surprise than it is to rely on the slender read of an international conference resolution. Sooner or later, weapons which are invented are going to be used. The best way to prevent war is to have so many of these weapons that the enemy will be deterred from attacking you. One of his fellow American delegates was the president of Cornell University, Andrew Dixon White. And at first, uh, White was a bit dismayed by Mahan's warlike tone. But later on he wrote, His views have been an excellent tonic. They have effectively prevented any lapse into sentimentality. When he speaks, the millennium fades and this stern, severe, actual world appears. Let me give you the example of one last conservative from the Roosevelt generation. Again, a great believer in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon supremacy and the conservative virtues. He was a US senator, but he resigned his seat after the passage of the 17th Amendment. This, was, this, the, this amendment took place in 1913, and it was, the, it was the constitutional amendment which led to the direct election of senators. Until then, the, the state governments, the state assemblies, had nominated men to become senators. 
And the whole point in the Constitution of having an unelected Senate was to restrain the democratic uh, principle which was embodied in the House of Representatives. But as, the, um, as, as um, the idea of democracy became more and more popular among most Americans, the um, amendment passed through Congress that now uh, senators and congressmen should be elected. Elihu Root was so horrified that he resigned his seat because he couldn't bring himself to campaign among the hoi polloi. Again, it's very much the, the same impulse shown by Coriolanus in Shakespeare's play. How dreadful to get down among the ordinary people. Now, the New Republic, a liberal magazine of the time, in an editorial said, no man can lead a people who has his back to the future. That was, that was their farewell to Elihu Root. But I think actually, um, this is exactly what a conservative would say he does have to do. The, let me read you the quotation again. No man can lead a people who has his back to the future. A conservative will say, surely, if he's leading them with his back to the future, it means he's looking towards the people he's leading. And if he looks at them and looks beyond them to the rich heritage of history, then he's got a lot to draw on. He's got a, a rich fund of experience. Whereas if he's looking at the future, it's empty and doesn't contain anything. And it's far too easy for him to fantasize about what it's really going to be like. So although the New Republic clearly intended to be insulting, in an odd way, they were, they were giving him an encomium on exactly what a conservative ought to be.